On this episode of Latinas, we'll celebrate Pride Month, meet Marvel's latest lesbian Latina superhero, and so much more. Latinas starts now. Welcome to Latinas, the show that's all about Nuestra Mujeres in the Latinx community. I'm Tina Beth Pina. Today, I'm at Christopher Park, a public space in Greenwich Village that's part of the Stonewall National Monument, commemorating the 1969 Stonewall Rebellion, an event that transformed the gay rights movement in the United States. While the theater world has long been enriched by the contributions of LGBTQ artists, a new documentary explores how queer identity, Latinidad, and storytelling took shape in the South Bronx. Correspondent Elena Romero traveled uptown to learn more. One of our co-founders was a very strong queer voice in the 70s, Luis Melendez. He passed away in the early 90s. We would have these profound conversations about what he thought, what he felt, and, and how he felt that he needed to have a bigger voice. That bigger voice is now being seen and heard in a short film called Queer Latine Voices at Pregones. The documentary serves as an oral history of queer playwrights and their related work. We're very grateful that this film was made because it does capture very succinctly the history, the values, the aesthetics of Asuncion, and the quality of the playwrights that we brought together. Asuncion is a national competition that was launched in 2003. It brought over 40 queer playwrights together with their local communities, and its success is finally being told through the documentary. Asuncion was an idea that happened after one of the shows that we did. It was called El Bolero Fue Mi Ruina, based on the writings of another amazing queer author, Manuel Ramos Otero. After one of the performances, I saw a group of colleagues celebrating that production, but saying, I wish our generation had this space to develop our own voices. And I went back home and I'm like, let's create that space. And if there's going to be a space like that for my generation to connect the dots, it would be here at Pregones. It's no coincidence that the name Asuncion stems from an anti-queer song. And I came up with the idea of Asuncion, inspired by a moment in my own life growing up as a queer man in Puerto Rico, where there was a song, Asuncion, Asuncion, ese hijo va a ser marinero, meaning this, your son is going to be queer. And growing up, I really was impacted by that, not in the best ways. As I became an adult and a theater artist, I said to myself, you know, let's create, let's use that that was meant to hurt us and turn that into a badge of honor and say, no, I'm going to talk about this this way. The documentary showcases how LGBTQA plus Latin A theater artists create art that authentically reflects their experiences. What would you like the audience to take away from the film? As we, uh, they watch this film and I'm thinking, wow, now I want to see that play, or oh wow, whenever I see Vicky Grice's play, or I want to see Charles Charles Gonzalez, or you know, Pablo Garcia Gámez, when I, when I see that author, I, I want to see what this is all about. And so it's a great tool to, to get people excited about wanting to see this variety of voices on stage. This initiative of, of this documentary in itself follows that path of reclaiming history and celebrating it in a way that makes sense to us and it informs who we are right now. I'm Elena Romero for Latinas. An unprecedented Supreme Court leak last month seemed to signal an end to abortion access nationwide. And in just a few weeks, our nation's highest court will make its final decision. But who will have the most to lose if Roe versus Wade is overturned? Diana Vargas has that story. Good evening. In a landmark ruling, the Supreme Court today legalized abortions. The majority in cases from Texas and Georgia said that the decision to end a pregnancy during the first three months belongs to the woman and her In the late 70s when Roe was enacted, the conservative right has 
continuously attempted to attack. And you see that in the form of state restrictions and even nationally. The situation for reproductive rights in the United States right now is in a very dangerous place. We're waiting for a decision from uh, the Supreme Court um, to decide on a lot of in infringements on women's rights that have happened in Mississippi specifically, but we've seen a lot of the Republican states deny women this right. The recent regulations to possibly restrict abortion in the United states will have a direct impact on all women but really hit women of color as well as low-income women hard. Roe no crea acceso. Es nada más un derecho en papel, pero para una persona indocumentada, para una persona pobre, como decías tú, si yo tengo en mi bolsillo cinco pesos, ¿puedo pagar ese procedimiento que cuesta 500 dólares? No. My, you know, abortion was covered through insurance, but my first one in Georgia, tuve que pagar de mi bolsillo. And for me, what's important is that it's not just about somebody's ability to get abortion care. It's looking at all the surrounding conditions. If that person's an immigrant, if that person is low income, if that person's transgender. According to the World Health Organization, women have risked their lives and health by seeking out unsafe abortion care. It's important to center people that are Black, Latino, uh, Asian, AAPI, simply because they are often the most impacted. Religion also plays a big part in how Latinos view abortion. It can be seen as a moral issue rather than a health one. To me, this is why the separation of church and state is so important. Deciding to have an abortion is a highly personal decision that should be made between the person and their doctor. It's an option. If you don't believe in it, you don't have to do it. A lot of times in immigrant rights spaces, you see a lot of Catholic charities, you know, supporting the immigrant rights movement, but don't talk about women's rights, don't talk about feminism, much less don't even touch the word abortion. And about two years ago, New York State actually codified Roe v. Wade. And what it says is we have the right to choose. People may not morally or religiously believe in abortion. That's their right. But as government, our duty is to protect your choice. In a recent survey, the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Justice found that 67% of Latinos would support a family member or a close friend if they choose to have an abortion. For Latinas, this is Diana Vargas. Have you ever wondered what it might be like to change your gender? Three transgender men are about to share their personal challenges and new sense of freedom in today's Caliente Caliente. I knew from a very young age, even like I would say like a baby, um, that I was not, I didn't feel feminine. I was just a very masculine child. Like, I grew up with two older brothers. I, a lot of the times, at the time, they were like saying like, oh, you're a tomboy. I've always known, like, uh, but I didn't really know uh, the word for it until I was like about 14. And then I came out a year later to my parents. But like, honestly, all my life, like I've always felt like I was a boy. I was always uncomfortable in my own skin, but I was like, all right, like, this is something that I'm used to, you know, being uncomfortable, being a fem like a female. So it's okay, like, you know, whatever, we go through it. My mom was diagnosed with cancer in 2016. I started questioning a lot about my life because I started living for her more. Mm. And then I started realizing like, I'm giving myself up more and more. So who am I? I started watching YouTube channels mm. and I was like, you can transition into a man. I had no idea. Like, I socially transitioned at the age of 15 but I didn't medically transition until last year, went on testosterone. My fear was how I would look after testosterone because I was so used to just seeing the way that I was and I was afraid of the voice change because I'm a singer too. But after a while, I decided like, none of that really matters and what matters is I want to like look on the outside how I feel on the inside. I mean, I got pretty lucky testosterone actually doesn't give me any negative side effects. Same here. Yeah, it was the estrogen that me too. messed me yeah. up. Oh, yeah. Too. Maybe some people have some reactions to testosterone where they feel like they're more 
angry or moody. Yeah. I think people expect you to be like the whole thing. <laughs> like once you get on TV. But I'm just like, honestly, being on estrogen made me way more unstable mm. emotionally. emotionally. Yeah. 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 Sure. And I was like crying, like crying the randomly mood or mood, sad. I feel like that was because it was like my uh, estrogen levels and yeah. stuff. But once I got on testosterone, it was like my mood like kind of just stab back. stabilized. Yeah, it's like the testosterone was, just was more meant calm. for us. It's, it was like yeah. meant for us. Top surgery messed me up. I don't know if my hormones went up and down or whatever the case yeah. may be, but acne was one major thing. That yeah, I definitely had an acne flare up like when I first started TV, but kind of chilled out. Thankfully. Yeah, your skin looks great, so. <laughs> 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 no, but literally, I think the more scariest part of transitioning, especially medically transitioning, is going through with surgery. I've yet to have any surgeries. I just feel like once I get through that, I'll be living my best life. Yeah, yeah 100%. Mm -hmm. Like, before I it changed, because with the T, but, like, top surgery after was, like, oh, I'm, like, a whole different person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's good. I hear that a lot with people, like, top surgery was, like, the best feeling ever. Liberating. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. life changing. Yeah. 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 How was it? Uh, like first experiencing being outside without a shirt and stuff like that. I how actually did it last week for the first time. Oh really? In, how was it? In Mexico. I, it was strange. It was just like I look at myself and I'm like, yeah, that's me. Like it. It just felt weird. It felt out of body. You know, everyone's still looking and look at the scars and mm -hmm. yeah. a lot of people that I was with didn't know I was trans. Again, they didn't treat me. Or they think you have open heart surgery or something. <laughs> yeah, somebody said they were like, you, you just look like you have open heart surgery. I'm yeah. like, the whole chest? Yeah. <laughs> so I, like, I think lung surgery is uh lung surgery, very yeah. yeah, very similar oh, scars. Okay. That's what I'm gonna say then. Now that we're transitioning and we're transitioning into like this male stereotype stereotype, I am not a macho man. Yeah. I play sports here and there. I cannot build you a desk. Like I can't even I can't I can't the even build like play doh. To par. No, I'm not that manly man, and like I like to get my hair done, my nails done. Like I'm very yeah. like metrosexual. Yeah, man. in both. So what I've noticed though now transitioning is that my family and friends, especially like in the Latin community, expect you to be like kill the spider. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, I run from spiders. I, I scream. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like any little thing. Like and then they're like really. My mom would be like, yo, man up. I'm like, I am. A man, but I'm not manning up. <laughs> yeah. Everything's so binary, like yeah. man, woman. You know, that's going back into like the '60s. You expect like yeah. a, a woman to just be in the kitchen, a man will be, <laughs> you know, working. But like at the end of the day, we're just human beings. We'll dive deeper into the lives of these three transgender men in upcoming episodes. Stay tuned. Nina Otero Warren was a leader in New Mexico's suffrage movement. She not only spearheaded efforts for the state to ratify a woman's right to vote, she also fought to publish all suffrage materials in Spanish as well as English. Otero Warren was also the first female to serve as superintendent of the Santa Fe public school system, where she advocated for bilingual education despite an English-only federal mandate at the time. Of Spanish heritage, Otero Warren was the first Latina to run for Congress and created a legacy of civil service through her work in education, politics, and public health. She will be the first Latina on an official coin and the second LGBTQ person featured when the U.S. Mint begins circulating quarters with her image this summer. Nina Otero Warren is today's Badass Latina. KR3TS is an acronym for Keep Rising to the Top, and it's also the name of Spanish Harlem's homegrown dance company. Correspondent Judith Escalona has that story. KR3T is the Spanish Harlem's homegrown school of street dance. It's where you can learn hip hop, light feet, Afrobeat, and even salsa for fun or to launch a career in dance. We're here to train amateurs to become professional. We're here to inspire them, empower them, challenge them, and guide them to their dreams. Those dreams are very real for Violeta, who was born and raised in Spanish Harlem and knows what it takes for a kid from the hood to break into the industry. She toured as a dancer with reggaeton artist El General, appeared in Grand Theft Auto 3 and 4. She's won a Latin Grammy for Best Choreography and an Emmy for a Telemundo commercial. Her students are following in her dance steps, including Noah Catala, the youngest of her three sons. 
Now 21, Noah acts, dances, and choreographs his own style of light feet. He was the studio baby and watching everything we did. So he would do anything, whatever salsa, he would imitate us, hip hop, b-boy locking. While Noah has branched out, he keeps close ties with KR3Ts where he teaches and rehearses his own dance company, The Bomb Squad. Lessons he learned working directly with his mom. When I used to teach at the Joffrey Ballet School, other projects, I'll have him with me assisting to gain that experience because he was passionate too. It was like a mini me. And like many of KR3T's students, for over 30 years, Violetta has been creating dances for them with themes her community can relate to. I just went with the flow of what was going on in my community or in the world. For instance, I did a tribute to life, and I dedicated to those that were lost by violent guns. These projects and others have won her community support, but funding is still a challenge. With KR3T's 32nd anniversary celebration coming up this September, Violetta hopes to raise enough money to keep rising to the top. Judith Escalona for Latinas. Marvel's latest movie introduces us to the first Latina LGBTQ superhero. And correspondent Marlene Peralta used her journalistic powers to learn more. You can travel the multiverse. Yep. Proven. She's Latina, a multiverse traveler, and no stranger to the concept of alternate realities. She's America Chavez the first major Latina in LGBTQ character created by Marvel. In the new movie, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. The part is played by Mexicana Xochitl Gomez, whose role in the movie proves to be an important factor in keeping the multiverse intact. She is so cool. Uh, she's so strong and powerful. She can kick and punch star-shaped portals that allow her to travel between universes. The 16-year-old Mexicana is proud to showcase her Latinidad on the big screen. Growing up, I didn't really have too many people to look up to um, uh, in terms of, you know, being a Latina. So it's great that I get to be that person that people look up to. And America just she represents so many people, and just having her on the screen it means a lot. Marvel Comics first introduced America Chavez in 2011 in the book Vengeance No. 1 as a lesbian teen. The film also features her LGBTQ identity as well as that of her lesbian parents. America represents so many people, and I feel like with her on the screen, so many people are going to feel represented. One way or another, they're going to see you know, themselves on screen with her. Marvel executive Victoria Alonso agrees. The visibility at any age um, is incredibly, incredibly important. So whether you're 10, 20, 30, 80, to have your people and to have someone that says, I am and it's okay. And what's next for the Latinx and LGBTQ communities in the Marvel Universe? The MCU has so many roads. Take a ticket, let's go for a car ride. It's awesome. <laughs> just just wait, Just we have so much coming. It, it, I think there is a little bit for everybody for a while. Believe it or not, Dr. Strange lives here on Bleecker Street in the village, a neighborhood that's also the epicenter of the gay rights movement. It may be a spot we will see America Chavez visit on the big screen. For Latinas, I am Marlene Peralta. Have you ever Googled yourself to see if anyone else shares your name? Well, I did, and met Tina Pina right here in New York City. And although our names are similar, we couldn't be any more different. This is my workshop, everyone. My name is Tina Pina, and I go by Mother Pigeon. I am a folk artist, street artist, performance artist, and a pigeon advocate. How did you become a pigeon advocate? I became a pigeon advocate uh, because the pigeons, they're here, they're beautiful, I adore them, and I wanted to do something that would give them some love because, you know, they're 
the most misunderstood bird, it seems to me, hated by a lot of people. And it, it just really upset me when I would see people, you know, kick at them or shoo them away. I thought, as an artist, what can I do to make them noticed and have people understand them more? And that's how I started doing what I do. What Mother Pigeon does is find unique ways to help people understand the pigeons she loves. That includes using all kinds of fabric to create pigeon puppets and soft pigeon sculptures that she sets up as installations on random sidewalks all over the city. What has been the reaction to people when they see you with the pigeons? Are they delighted? Are they like, oh, what is this woman doing? I get a mixed reaction. Um, some people will walk by and go, that's disgusting. Like, ew, oh, oh, you know, and then I get brilliant, amazing, just a lot of accolade all day, and it's great, it's amazing. And I like both, you know, I, I mean, I'm fine with both. I, the only part I don't like is when they are, ew, that's disgusting, because I don't take it personally, I take it as if they're doing it to the pigeon, which do, does hurt my feelings. Now, if I'm walking down the street and someone goes, oh, you look like a freak, or, you know, happy Halloween, or whatever, I don't care, you know, whatever, that's fine. But like, you know, make fun of a pigeon, mm, kind of. I don't like that. The Mexicana's love of pigeons is so strong that she's coming out with a children's book called Hi, a Mother Pigeon that she wrote and illustrated and hopes will get kids and their parents loving pigeons as much as she does. I want people to know that they are clean animals. The only time they're dirty is because they have to live in our filth. And we don't give them any, we don't give them anything. We don't give them uh, bird baths or uh, fresh food. I mean, so many flocks just struggle so hard in the city. It's just important to, you know, care for the animals that are around us because we can't just live in this cement metropolis and, and think that we're gonna be okay. We need to, just looking at them and holding them and seeing their little faces and their little feet. They're adorable. They're adorable. They're amazing. They're little magical creatures that fly. Just in time for graduation season, illustrator and entrepreneur Sandra Diaz has created a series of art prints, stationery, and greeting cards celebrating Latina graduates in particular. And that's why she's today's Latina on the Rise. One of the biggest influences that I had in my life was my grandmother, Lucia, Lucia Builes. She was the first person that bought a commission piece for me, and it was such a happy moment. When I was 10 years old, I remember I used to paint her a lot. I used to sketch her, and she really liked the watercolor piece that I did of her, and I literally you know, gave it for Mother's Day and she turned around, go, went into her purse and gave me $100. And as a 10 year old, you're like, oh my goodness, $100, that's incredible. And she is somebody that told me, please always charge for your work. Never ever give it to, for anybody for free, not even your family. Hola, my name is Sandra Lucia Diaz. I am the founder and creator of Lucia Diaz. I'm a Latina illustrator and business owner. The type of illustrations that I do are to celebrate the everyday Latina. Let's take a break <laughs> and make sure that we celebrate ourselves. And especially me being first generation Latina, I had a lot of weight on my shoulders, making sure that I not only was my parents translator, but also set a good example for my brother to make sure that I navigated what it was to be the first in my family to go to college, what it was the first in the family to graduate even from high school. I developed the graduation collection because I had a bunch of primas that were graduating and I couldn't find anything in the store that looked like them. And so I decided, you know what? I'm gonna go ahead and create my own collection to celebrate Latinas, especially not just a particular segment of Latinas, but all Latinas, because Latinas come in all shades, all shapes, all colors, all hair types. And I feel like Latinas specifically don't typically um, celebrate all of their milestones, all of their wins. They're always working towards the next win, the next project, the next promotion. So for me, it's really about just taking a moment to celebrate your achievement. So the graduation collection stemmed from the love of inclusivity and making a stationary collection that's completely diverse. 
Every single collection that I create, I give back to my community. Specifically with the graduation collection, I want to make sure that e that collection is tied back to students that are, you know, struggling with DACA applications. So I'm partnering up with United We Dream to make sure that we, I give back to that specific foundation that are gonna help Latinas with DACA applications. I think of me, myself, as a Latina, as a young girl, and not seeing enough representation on TV, in media, in stationery, in, in the world, even as artists, like having a very limited palette of artists that I can look up to, like Frida Kahlo. It's really about making sure that Latinas feel loved, celebrated, and represented. Understand that you're able and you're capable of doing everything that you set your mind to, and don't let anybody stop you. And even if it's family, don't let people stop you from what you want to do or, or be who you authentically are. And that's our show for today. For more information on what you just saw, check out our website at tv.cuny.edu and follow our social media profiles because we love sharing our Latina stories with you. And please make sure you tune in next month where we'll recap the best segments of the season. Uepa! Hasta la próxima. Bye-bye.